our plights this week. But uh, at any rate, uh, you know, pace yourselves uh, if you're at home. Uh, you know, feel no need uh, to finish these all off uh, in one setting and uh, eat something. Uh, eat something. Uh, it's a really important part of the Amaro experience. Uh, in as much as they are digestifs, they only function that way uh, if you've had something to eat. So uh, not a good class for an empty stomach, uh, this one. Uh, with me, as always, Zoe Nystrom. Zoe, uh, say hello to the people. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, that is uh, Zoe's map of France uh, behind her in uh, the home studio. Um, but we're going to be uh, focusing uh, really on Italy. Uh, that's not to say that Italy has a monopoly on uh bitter tinctures to close out the meal. Um, you know, this style of drink uh, exists throughout uh, the old world and has spread to the new. But Italy uh, has really claimed it as its own. And, you know, these drinks uh, from one to the next are hugely significant cultural signifiers uh, for the citizens of the boots. And we want to honor that. And, you know, in as much as any of us love Amaro, Italian Amari uh, were the first love. Uh, should be said, Amari is the plural. Um, I'll probably skip between that and Amaro's just because, you know, it sounds a little weird in English, but uh, at any rate, uh, don't consider me too insufferable uh, if I use the Italian. Um, for those of you at home, uh, we had all sorts of options uh, for this lesson uh, so as far as the flights went. Uh, four uh, different pours, two ounces each, uh, given the higher proof. Uh, on these uh, ranging anywhere uh, from, you know, 15 to 20% alcohol, uh, all the way up to 35 and 40. Uh, we are gonna start for the sake of this class with our herbal tinctures. And uh, those are a series of botanical infused vodkas. And we're, you know, trying to um, really get at uh, the heart of uh, the botanical world um, that is, you know, the true uh, underpinning uh, for Amaro the uh, field and forest, very much the pharmacy of the ancient world. And uh, this notion of infusing alcoholic beverages um, with all sorts of bittering herbs um, and, you know, all sorts of barks and spices and honeys, uh, it is as old as fermentation uh, itself. Um, you know, wine in antiquity very often uh, was flavored uh, with all, all sorts of herbs, uh, beer uh, as well. Um, hops itself uh, is just another species of bittering uh, botanical. Um, and once distillation made its way to uh, Europe, uh, that happened uh, on a, a large scale uh, beginning in the 15th and 16th century, uh, it was only fitting that, you know, these uh, medicinal herbs made their way into alcoholic uh, tinctures. And they're very much, you know, the uh, Tylenol, the Advil, the Pepto-Bismol um, of their own time. And uh, people consumed them to settle the stomach. They had all sorts of uh, purported uh, kind of uh, pale, or all sorts of purported, um, you know, homeopathic uh, properties. And over time, people developed a taste uh, for these elixirs. Um, and they became, you know, the original, you know, brands. Um, and uh, in every corner of Italy, you know, the unique local recipe uh, kind of reflected what was locally available um, as far as, uh, you know, the uh, botanicals uh, that were on offer and, you know, uh, could be readily accessed uh, for your corner uh, druggist, uh, as it were. Um, big ups to the Tyler family uh, joining us from Paradise. Um, they are participating uh, from the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, and we are thrilled to have them with us uh, together uh, for the first time in many moons. Uh, we are thrilled to have you all uh, joining us uh, remotely, uh, together virtually, uh, in this, uh, you know, virtual uh, lecture hall. Um, you know, that coming together really, you know, is, is what Amaro uh, is, is all about, um, an excuse to uh, extend, uh, you know, our time, uh, an excuse to, you know, chase away uh, the cares of our work days like and, you know, linger over these incredibly complex, um, you know, kind of herbal uh, elixirs. Um, and, uh, you know, kick things off um, uh, for the sake of our lesson here. We have hopefully a few more folks uh, to join us. But uh, again, uh, if you're at home, there's no way, a wrong way to enjoy these. Uh, just make sure you're eating something along with them uh, if you're lucky enough. Uh, to purchase cheese from us. Uh, just a quick proviso for the sake of the Telegia mousse, um, there is a burnt strawberry jam situation that is absolutely fabulous, but 
uh, that is best with the mousse uh, as well as the semolina crumble. So uh, that burnt strawberry jam and the semolina crumble designed to go with uh, the Telesio mousse. Um, that's not to say uh, they won't be delicious uh, with the individual cheeses, but they will be uh, most delicious uh, with the mousse itself. So uh, now that we have gotten that PSA over, um, as always, we're going to kick things off uh, with uh, a bit of verse. I'll uh, kick that off. Uh, earlier in the lesson, uh, so that people uh, don't fear um, that I've forgotten uh, my love of poetry, uh, you know, to uh, begin proceedings. This is from Eugenio Montale, um, uh, originally um, uh, from Genoa. Um, he kind of settled in uh, Milan. Uh, he's a Nobel uh, laureate uh, in the 70s and writes uh, some of the most beautiful modern uh, Italian poetry that I can think of. Uh, this is called Meriggiare, Meriggiare. Um, and I apologize for my cartoonish Italian ac accent. I feel like I am, you know, the Pepe Le Pew, the Speedy Gonzalez of Italian, but it, it does feel like one of those languages that you want to lean into. Um, if I'm leaning in too far for the native speakers, you know, please, um, you know, don't take any offense. Uh, I enjoy it, but meriggiare um, is a verb form of uh, the Italian word for noon. Um, and what I love is in Italian, it connotes this idea of uh, lingering in the hot summer sun um, and finding a spot in the shade uh, to kind of while away the hours. And the Italians have one word for that, um, which, you know, is beautiful um, to me. Uh, so this is Meriggiare from Eugenio Montale. To spend the afternoon absorbed and pale beside a burning garden wall, to hear among the stubble and the thorns, the blackbirds cackling and the rustling snakes. On the cracked earth or in the vetch to spy on columns of red ants now crossing, now dispersing atop their miniature heaps. To ponder peering through the leaves, the heaving of the scaly sea, while the cicada's wavering screech goes up from balding peaks. And walking out into the sunlight's glare to feel with melancholy wonder how all of life and its travail is in this following a wall topped with the shards of broken bodies. Um, what a beautiful bit of verse. Um, you know, that kind of, you know, speaks for itself, but um, again, you know, speaks to this idea of, you know, uh, you know, just lingering. Uh, the Italians are, you know, some of the world's great lingerers. Um, you know, I always find, you know, having, you know, vacation in Italy that initially I struggle with it. You know, if you sit down at a restaurant in especially Southern Italy, you know, there are no quick meals there. You kind of have to adjust your internal clock. And, you know, I have trouble getting off of East Coast time, but once you adjust to the new way of life, um, it is, you know, seductive and entrancing in and of its own, um, you know, right? And I think, you know, Amaro gives us uh, an excuse, um, you know, to adopt, you know, for a spare moment, um, that notion of, uh, um, you know, uh, mezzogiati. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, let's kick it. Um, Amaro um, is, you know, uh, as old as distillation. So um, spirits didn't come to the continent um, uh, until um, really the, uh, the Arab conquerors of uh, Spain uh, brought the science with them um, beginning in the 8th century. Um, started to become widespread in the 12th, but um, the modern Alembic uh, still was only developed um, also um, uh, by um, Muslims uh, in Turkey, um, you know, beginning in the 15th, uh, 16th century. And that's when uh, spirits um, fortified alcohols became available across the continent. And um, they were a boon. Uh, to druggists, to herbalists, uh, to amateur doctors everywhere, because all of these bitter herbs and uh, digestives that, you know, had filled, um, you know, the medicine cabinets of the ancient world uh, became more potent um, as tinctures, as, um, you know, uh, these elixirs, as these infusions um, in alcohol. Alcohol has this remarkable ability to extract flavor from all things, but particularly from these bitter herbs. And that is what Amaro celebrates. And in crafting Amaro, you start with an infusion of these herbs in spirit. Uh, the spirit itself um, is typically then combined. It's either diluted with water or with wine or with, uh, you know, um, actually grape must uh, for a product that's called Mistel. Um, and then uh, some sugar is added. So uh, originally these medicines would have been more acrid and less sweet, but as they became commercial products, uh, sugar was typically added so that 
you know, they became more balanced. Um, the adding of sugar makes the bitterness more palatable and also, um, you know, makes the spectrum of flavors, um, you know, much more readily uh, apparent and, you know, multifaceted for us um, in our enjoyment of these drinks. Uh, very often, you know, you'll notice these are, are caramel toned elixirs. Um, and it should be said, you know, that caramel color can be added artificially, but it can also be added through, um, you know, either cane sugar or caramel syrups um, to, uh, these individual products. Um, it is possible um, that uh, we have some Italians in our midst, uh, Francesca Nonino um, and Leo Pascale Vena of um, Amaro Nonino and Amaro Lucano. Uh, we're going to hope uh, to join us. So uh, if you're in the audience, please uh, don't hesitate as I discuss your products uh, to join us. Um, I Hi, guys. Oh, brilliant. Francesca. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. That's me. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, buonasera. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, and just I'm just sorry that um, I'm not prepared. I do not have any like uh, any of the old label with me because it, I'm uh, at my house. I'm not in the in the distillery where we where we keep all the old bottles of the legacy of Amaronino. But uh, um, thank you for inviting me tonight. I'm really not. It's for you. It's not tonight. Sorry, for me it's tonight. It's here, here it's 10 p.m. <laughs> It's, it's already my bedtime in here. <laughs> well, it is. Oh, come on. What kind of Italian are you, Fred? It feels like a very early bedtime for an Italian. Yeah, but I'm I'm from the north, you know. So like <laughs> not the north, we go to 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 sleep early. And also okay. in here, I don't know how are things over there, but uh, um, we after with this COVID thing, we actually cannot go out after 10 p.m. So like no, uh, no discos. No discos for us, no. but it's always a Magnonino time. I, I only have a little empty bottle. <laughs> <laughs> at least we can drink at home. <laughs> oh, great, great. So, um, uh, Francesca, we're going to start uh, with uh, your products. And I um, made these uh, tinctures with a lot of the herbs that traditionally go into um, traditional Italian Amari. And I thought it would be fun to talk about the individual uh, ingredients. So we're actually... I don't know how many of these uh, are in yours. So I know that you use gentian, um, you traditionally use cinchona, um, uh, and uh, we have uh, vermouth and angelica roots. I don't know if those figure. So, so like, um, I don't want to disappoint anyone, but actually um, the Amaro Nonino recipe yeah, yeah, is that- yeah. I had a very lazy Sunday where all of a sudden- Oh, sorry, Caitlin. Caitlin. Uh, so uh, Francesca, we had a, a rogue comment over there. Are uh, you were saying? Uh, I was saying that actually a Magnolina recipe is a secret family recipe. Nobody oh, secret. except from the family knows it. Even for me, like I'm working officially in the family company since, uh, well, unofficially since all my life, <laughs> but officially since four years. And I had to wait two years uh, to be able to learn the secret family oh, wow. recipe. And it was, I can tell you, it was a really big deal. I don't know if any of you is familiar with uh, um, Nonino family, but we are a family of distillers since 1897, and um, now we are mostly a female-led family distillery. And uh, I remember that day, like it was yesterday, um, my grandmother called me in her office. So she was like, Francesca, I need to talk with you. I was like, oh, okay, what did I do? And <laughs> she called me in her office, and th she was sitting there with my mom and my auntie by her, and they were like, uh, we talk and we decided that uh, now you can know the recipe. It was like, oh, wow. <laughs> really? But my grandma <laughs> looked at me and she, and she was like, but you cannot tell anyone, not even your husband. I was like, but I'm not even married. <laughs> like, it's really like a really, really big deal. And honestly, for what I'm, uh, for what I learned about uh, Amaro, I think that Amaro Nino is one of the best uh, Amaro to start uh, um, to learn about this beautiful uh, Italian liqueur. This is the Amaro flight I didn't buy. <laughs> uh, so let's, uh, let's start with, uh, I'm going to start with each of these botanicals quickly and introduce them and then, um, you know, feel free to add what you like. Uh, if you're, you know, kind of familiar with the individual botanicals, we will neither confirm nor deny whether they are actually in the Amaro Nonino. Uh, we will not I cannot tell anything. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we'll talk about the individual botanicals because, you know, the individual ingredients are really interesting. And, you know, they have all this history uh, of their own, which is really fascinating. And then, you know, my favorite thing about Nonino is that there's this added layer history of, 
of this beautiful spirit that you use for the product itself, and then you age everything in barrique thereafter. So it's a very artisanal product uh, in a way that um, is, yeah. is, is somewhat unique for Amaro. Yeah, but also like um, um, the original recipe of Amaro Nonino was uh, Amaro di Carnia, and it was created by my great grandfather, Antonio Nonino. It was already the third generation of uh, uh, Nonino family. So he was uh, a distiller. And uh, already at that time, it was really um, common, we can say, for Italian family to have their own family recipe. As, as you said before, Amaro is something that is really local. We can say that uh, every region has its own recipe that was based from the botanical they could find. But uh, my great-grandfather did something that was different from what other um, family were making with the Amaro, because instead of using just uh, any type uh, of gray neutral uh, spirit, uh, he decided to use uh, something that he was making since many generations, because it was already the third generation. So he decided to use as a base uh, the grappa he was making. And that was something that gave a completely different type of kick to our Amaro because uh, it's, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with grappa, but it's not a neutral spirit. It's really aromatic, a uh, um, lot of flavor, fruity flavor, but also consider that we are in the Northeast of Italy. I, I see that you show um, a little map before. We are in the Northeast of Italy. Uh, we are, yes, Pliuli Venezia Giulia, the yellow one, great. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the yellow one. And so like, because we are at the border with many different countries, we were like, um, we can say that Friuli Venezia Giulia was kind of a melting pot uh, of different culture. Um, and so Amaro Nonino, Amaro di Carnia, sorry, was already this beautiful melting pot. Instead of having just the botanicals that you were able to find uh, locally, it also has spices and, uh, um, and roots uh, uh, that were, coming from completely different culture, from really, really far away, because we are just one hour from Venice. And that gave a completely different type of richness to our Amaro. And then, like my, sadly, my great-grandfather got killed during Second World War. So uh, my great-grandmother um, was the one that uh, um, started to lead the, the distillery, and she became the first uh, uh, female master distillery in Italy. Oh, wow. And she took over the recipe of Amaro Nonino. And because before being a um, master distiller, she was having her own little restaurant. She had a really beautiful knowledge of the botanical, of how to balance uh, the different type of taste. So she took over the Amaro de Carnia recipe because at the beginning in 1933 it was Amaro de Carnia. And she changed it a little bit, making it more beautiful, more balanced. She added a little bit of the botanicals and she took, um, like she, I don't, sorry, my English suck at this time. <laughs> <laughs> sure. it's much, she, Francesca, much better than my Italian. <laughs> I, I don't know about that, but, <laughs> and she decreased a little bit of the other, making it, oh, thank you so much, Janice, for supporting me. I feel a little bit uh, weird, <laughs> but like, and she decreased a little bit of uh, other ingredients to make it more elegant. Uh, but what made completely the difference was the fact that uh, my great-grandmother, not my great-grandmother, sorry, my grandmother and my grandfather, thank you, Frank, in 1984, they created the first grape distillate. So instead of just using um, the pomas or uh, the juice of the, of the grape, they distilled the whole thing. And in 1990, 1987, they put the grape distillate into aging. So my mom and my aunt decided to change the grape, the distillate, the grappa distillate that was in the Amaro with the grape distillate aging barrique. And that was completely made the difference. One thing that I love about the label, I don't know if you can see it, is the fact that there is in the middle, the IGEA cup that represents the medicinal properties of the Amaro that was the main purpose when it was created to use the botanicals that people thought they had medicinal properties. And the name Quintessencia, I think it's really beautiful because Quintessencia, no, I'm not saying that this is medicinal, but I'm saying uh, <laughs> it seems like I need to have it. Yes, like it helps honestly to have a manolino a little bit every day. It's really helpful for <laughs> your spirit 
on your part, but no, but like at the beginning, uh, the Amaro um, was created because people wanted to use the herbal uh, and spices that people thought had medicinal properties, like to help digestion, uh, for cold. They even used to give a little bit of Amaro to, to women they just gave birth because they thought that gave strength to people to fight the cold. Um, but like quintessentia means to, to reach the alchemic perfection because uh, this is a family recipe that was passed from generation to generation. And we thought that uh, this, uh, the fact that uh, every Nonino generation changed it a little bit really made the difference, making it now uh, something that we're really, really, really proud of. And it's considered one of the most balanced Amaro and uh, the best Amaro you know, to start the Amaro, the Amaro journey, we can say. Yeah, and I think I think for people that are new to Amaro, it's it's not a very Amaro Amaro. You know, it's 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 you know has just enough of that bitterness, but not not too much. And you know, you spoke to some of those uh, you know medicinal herbs. We have here uh, Angelica, and I'm going to share some uh, you know pictures of the individual herbs. Angelica's is really um, interesting. Uh, Angelica, it looks a bit you know like um, you know if if you look at it. Um, it's actually, it's, it's a beautiful uh, uh, plant and uh, it's a member of um, the same family as carrots. Um, and uh, it's related to parsley and dill and hemlock. It has this kind of um, barky uh, woodsiness. It is uh, historically a digestive aid. And, you know, uh, you talked about, you know, that use of these uh, products as, as medicine. And, you know, a lot of that predates modern science, but a lot of that com was confirmed ultimately, um, you know, by modern scientists. And there are certain chemicals that are scientifically aids to digestion. And uh, empirically, it should be said that um, a lot of, you know, uh, those bitter flavors do stimulate uh, digestion for people. And, and, you know, that is another, you know, empirical reason uh, that folks will drink these. Um, I love uh, Angelica because uh, it, it's a little less bitter uh, to start with among the tinctures. And these are all vodka-based tinctures. So, if you're drinking these and then going to the Nino at home, you can get a sense of, you know, how uh, much of a difference there is going from a neutral uh, grape spirit like vodka uh, to going to, you know, something uh, like grappa. And then another uh, second one that we have here is uh, chinchona. And chinchona is hugely uh, important to uh, both, um, you know, a lot of different vermouths and uh, also to Amari. Um, chinchona is the bark of a South American tree and it was used by um, you know, ultimately uh, by Europeans, um, by, um, you know, the Spanish uh, that conquered um, uh, South America um, to ward off um, malaria, but it had been used by the Incas uh, for, you know, uh, centuries, if not, you know, thousands of years before that um, as a cure for fevers and headaches and, um, you know, problems with digestion. Uh, and Chinchona is hugely uh, fascinating, um, you know, it, uh, it's called the fever tree. It has this kind of um, more kind of warming, uh, spicy uh, quality to it. It's certainly more bitter um, than something uh, like the angelica, uh, but a little less bitter uh, than the uh, gentian or the wormwood uh, that we're going to come upon. So uh, the gentian uh, should be said one of my favorites. Um, uh, Francesca spoke uh, to uh, this notion of, you know, Italy being at the crossroads of different trade routes and Friuli in particular you know, being sandwiched between, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of like uh, central Italy and, um, you know, the more alpine regions and uh, the Balkans. And uh, gentian is hugely important uh, throughout the mountains of central Europe. Um, it's actually very difficult to uh, cultivate in a modern garden. Um, and uh, it grows wild. Um, it's typically harvested after four to five years. It has this amazing, grassy, profoundly bitter quality. Gentian's amazing. Uh, it's very green. Um, uh, you know, gentian from higher altitudes is prized. Uh, typically, the level of bittering compounds vary throughout the year and tend to be higher in the spring. Um, and the harvest is actually uh, pretty strictly regulated, particularly in France, uh, to um, protect uh, the gentian uh, itself. And then the last one you have in your glasses um, uh, is uh, wormwood. Um, wormwood is uh, particularly important, particularly in Amaro Lucano. Um, they use several different kinds of uh, wormwood. Uh, wormwood gets a bad rap in um, absinthe. Um, it gets a bad rap um, for a uh, chemical constituent um, that um, on its own can induce um, seizures, but you'd have to drink um, so much uh, absinthe at that point that you would be, you know, 
uh, already uh, six feet under. Uh, wormwood grows really well in gardens, actually pretty beautiful, and it's actually equally uh, a very good digestive aid. Uh, I find it's a little less green, um, you know, in terms of its set of flavors uh, than gentian and a little more kind of sharply bitter uh, in and of its own right um, than, um, you know, the uh, other botanicals that we were dealing with. Um, there are other really important bittering agents that I didn't get to, Chinese rhubarb, uh, bitter orange, citrus is hugely important in uh, Amari. Um, it is kind of the bridge between the sweeter flavors and the more bitter ones. Um, and if you're eating uh, cheese at home, we have all sorts of jams. Those citrus jams are really perfect uh, with Amaro. Um, Francesco, we didn't talk about, uh, we talked about the grappa um, and you know, you feel free to, um, you know, divulge uh, as many of the family secrets as you like, but can you describe the production process um, uh, for this Amaro? You know, you start with, you know, all sorts of herbs. Um, uh, how do you go about infusing them and, and ultimately aging uh, the final product? So like, uh, I have to say that uh, um, there are two different type uh, of uh, uh, making process for Yamaha Nonino. There are both infusion and maceration. So like, uh, for what it concerns, the process uh, of making Amaro, I can tell you really little, and I'm sorry because uh, <laughs> uh, I want to. I want to. Your leave grandmother. You. <laughs> I want to leave, and all of these things is registered, so you can use this against me. <laughs> we can hit pause on the recording. And <laughs> no, um, but like, what really makes the difference uh, is the fact that uh, um, we we do a really a longer infusion and maceration process uh, and the fact that uh, all of this uh, uh, is involved with uh, a really uh, low temperature to be able to preserve not only the aromatic characteristic uh, uh, and the taste of the botanicals but also the colors of the botanicals and also of course the color of our amaro is also given by the fact that we use this age grape distillate and uh, I think it's amazing the fact that our age grape distillate is aged for really long even for more than four to five years uh, like we have a uh, aging cellar for grape distillate since uh, 1987 so like uh, uh, we try to make a blend of the grape distillate to, to be able to give uh, the notes both of uh, Bo both a kind of like a, a smokiness to it, uh, but also these beautiful exotic fruit notes. Uh, and I hope that all of you can come to visit our distillery and uh, and enter also in our aging cellar because it's beautiful. But like when you enter in the aging cellar of grape uh, distillate, uh, you can really smell the Amaro Nonino uh, type of smell that you smell in the in the glass uh, that that gave these mango notes this. Uh, uh, papaya notes, but also licorice, chocolate. And one thing that I love so, so much is the fact that uh, I was saying that in the chat, uh, but like uh, a Magnolino, um, we can say that uh, have a type of uh, tasting profile. Sorry, I, I sometimes no. I try to invent my word That's if I'm great. not good with <laughs> yeah. tasting pro profile that is both uh, fruity, herbal, and spice. Uh, but because of that, uh, like even if you just uh, do like a two kind of ingredient cocktail, like uh, ice, um, a slice of orange on, or some um, fresh mint leaves, uh, you can really highlight uh, one of these um, um, characteristic over the other one. So, like if you put the and uh, a fresh orange slice, uh, it can like you can really smell like uh, Sicily, like because. I can tell you, I can tell you three of the ingredients that we use in our Magnonino and are lime, lemon, and oranges from Sicily and Amalfi Coast. And you can really feel like you're in, are in Amalfi Coast. But like if you add the mint leaves, you really highlight the herbal part, but always with freshness. And I read uh, that someone was talking about paper plane. Uh, Yes, we need to start to, to 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 convince Bill to come visit us. Uh, all, all of you are, are are welcome to come. Please text me. I can write to my email after after that. But like, you need to come to visit us also because you need to come and taste uh, Amaronino just from the barrique. It's an amazing in, in, yeah. uh, <laughs> experience. But like, um, I have to say that uh, 
I'm really glad someone some one of you to talk about the paper plane because uh, I think actually that the paper plane cocktail was uh, the one that made Amaro Nonino popular uh, in the United States. It was created from by Sam Ross and uh, he decided to create this cocktail because one of the uh, his uh, dear friend brought to him a bottle of Amaro Nonino and he fell in love with it. And he decided that he wanted to make a cocktail that was able to highlight the Amaro Nonino characteristic. Uh, the fact that uh, the thing that he sent me that he loved really much about Amaro Nonino was the fact that it has a, a beautiful, bittersweet balance uh, so that uh, you needed it to add any type of syrup, but you still add the bitterness type the bitter type of notes. And if you do not know Pepper Plain, please taste one because it's an amazing, amazing cocktail. Sorry, but I, I feel like I'm talking too much. Sorry, Bill. No, I'm no, no, no talk. worries. You know, you're, you're great. No, we, we're thrilled to have you on. So uh, just for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the cocktail, um, uh, Pepper Plain is, a, um, is an ama amazing uh, kind of modern classic uh, drink. And uh, it has uh, whiskey, Aperol, and uh, Amar and Nino in it. And, um, you know, it's very much, you know, uh, a new a new classic and you know it's the kind of thing that um you know in the space of a decade um has become you know a a new standard um in a, in a really awesome way and um you know it's it's a wonderfully both like refreshing and multifaceted drink and you know i think it embodies a lot of what you said and a lot of what i love about tomorrow in the first place which is that you know these are drinks that you can linger over and part of the reason that they're fun to linger over is because they're so complex and you know depending on how you serve them or you know, how you um, add to them, you know, they, they reveal a different, you know, aspect of their personality. And uh, I actually read, so we had a lot of folks coming into this lesson, ask, um, you know, uh, how should they, they serve these, uh, you know, um, various Samari that we're, that we're featuring. And, um, you know, I read that, you know, uh, you and some other folks in your family actually prefer, um, you know, over ice um, with like a, a lemon wedge as opposed to just drinking it neat. Sorry. Do you do you prefer an anino over ice, or do you like it, uh, you know, neat or? Okay, uh, I'm the type. Uh, I I think that uh, you will judge me, but I like uh, a malamino on everything. Like it's incredible. <laughs> but like, if I want to be like, I think, and this is my suggestion for, like, an Italian suggestion for all of you guys. If you really want to appreciate uh, the quality of a product. Uh, you need to uh, taste it. Uh, um, at, at, how do you say? Like uh, at normal temperature, like room temperature. Yes, room temperature. Because a lot of times, uh, at least uh, in, uh, in in Italian commercial, they they give you suggestion like to taste uh, amaro frozen. When you froze <laughs> stuff, uh, it's because uh, it tastes bad, uh, and so you're able to cover bad taste uh, or bad. Uh, Del Capo, they they in, in Calabria they drink they drink very cold. Uh. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> I I just say that uh, when you throw stuff, you're able to cover bad taste and bad smell. So you're really able to appreciate the quality of a product when it's room temperature. But uh, of course, uh, I think honestly that uh, uh, chill is the best way. So with a little bit of ice. Uh, and a slice of orange is my favorite. But um, we also love uh, to do like um, hot preparation for Amaro. I was saying in the chat that we use uh, Amaro Nonino also, for example, in chicken broth uh, or for doing like a punch. And it's delicious. Um, but maybe... Francesca, do you, I, just, do, you drink, do you just drink the broth? The broth with Amaro Nonino, yes. Wow, that sounds delicious. Yeah, it is delicious. Yeah. But also, I love to, 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 like, one of my favorite things, but I know that in the United States it's not popular right now, but I love mojito. I love mojito. <laughs> Throw away the rum, put a magnonino. It's the oh. best mojito in the, oh, yes. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Hot of taste. course, pepper. Now, um, uh, Zoe, do we have any questions <laughs> for Francesca? She's doing a very good job of monitoring the chat much, uh, so... Uh, that's something I struggle with, Francesca. I'm not good at chatting and uh, and talking. Um, do you have any questions that haven't been uh, addressed yet, though? Yes, like, um, sorry. Uh, Francesca, how else do you use Nonino in cooking? Sorry? How else do you use um, Nonino in cooking in the kitchen? 
so like uh, of course we we do sorbet most of the time uh, as i said popsicle but also like a lot uh, of food pairing for example i don't know if you're familiar with the uh, lind chocolate the metal chocolatier of lind suggested to eat the uh, um, 75% or 85 or 80% dark chocolate paired with a magnolino and it's amazing. In a lot of different type of chocolate dessert is amazing. But um, yeah, we can say that for salty, uh, for salty recipe, main, like the main, um, the main thing is the chicken broth. But uh, I have to say that uh, I was impressed because one time, but I did not taste it, so I cannot tell you if it's good. I saw that there was this one person that um, used uh, um, a magnolino to flambe. Do you do you say the uh, word yeah. flambe? Yeah. To flambe prawns in the Ooh. pasta. Ooh. That sounds but good. I didn't try that, so I cannot tell you if yeah. it's good or not. All right. I, chocolate brownie, yes. And also, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> um, ice cream chocolate. Okay. Chocolate ice cream, sorry, not ice cream <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> Gelati. Gelato, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we uh, should we said Francesca that we uh, we set everybody up with uh, uh, cheese and like citrus preserves uh, to go with uh, their Mari tonight too. So uh, that that is a personal favorite. I I love uh, like citrus jam uh, and, oh. and and uh, and anino, and it's, it's actually the like, good you can use anino in citrus. Yeah. Oh my god! So like citrus jam and which type of cheese? All all cheese. I actually like. With the lighter ones, I kind of like the saltier cheeses, and I, I sometimes like the darker amari with with like softer unctuous cheeses, but like hard salty cheese. Yeah. Oh my god! You just made you just made me realize this thing. One time, because I'm the social media manager also for Nonino, and like uh, so, if someone puts something on uh, Instagram, I'm always the one that uh, see the tag and stuff like that. And there was this woman uh, from England that made. Uh, a raspberry jam recipe using a magnolino and I was like oh my god it looks delicious she shipped this uh, raspberry jam to me and I can tell you it was unbelievable even raspberry jam with a magnolino so like most of the recipe are sweet recipe but now I'm really intrigued with this match between uh, uh, citrus jam and uh, cheese it it's sounds good. amazing yeah it's really good uh, Zoe what else we got um, could you speak a little bit about how the distillation process is different for grappa than it is for other spirits? So, like, um, it's it's um, different. It is different for your grappa than other grappas too. Yes. Um, well, can I say one thing without uh, sounding uh, an asshole? But uh, <laughs> we were. <laughs> We won this the prize as Spirit Brand of the Year by one enthusiast, one star award, and we were the first Italian distillery to win it uh, and the first grappa brand. So we were really, really, really happy about that. It was at the beginning of this year. It was the 27th of January 2020. And it was me, my aunt, and my grandmother. Um, and it was amazing. It was the last trip I did this year. <laughs> it was, yes, yes, then lockdown. But like, yes, at least... Uh, at least I was in America in February, but I miss it. I miss to come to America so, so, so much, guys, really. But like, um, yeah, um, the, the deal, like we can say like that, uh, sadly, uh, for what concern Italian laws, uh, Italian laws do not protect the quality in the distillation enough. Uh, so like, what is the main difference from our distillery to any other distillery? is the fact that we are the only distillery that has the structure to be able to distill fresh. Uh, why I'm saying that, but this is what, from what it concerned with Rapa. And I think that maybe I can be a little bit uh, confusing for it, for you. I don't know if you wanted to know what was the difference between our distillery. Well, yeah, let's say like, so most, you know, I think most people, Grappa is is like Mark in the sense that, you know, traditionally in Italy, it was, it was a, a spirit of, you know, frugal farmers. So it was a way to yeah. reuse, um, you know, pomace. Um, and, yes. and you all have taken it and you've made it, you know, a primary product as opposed yes. to, you know, something that's secondary. And and that's because you use, not only do you use the the great, um, you know, stems and, and skins, but you also use the, the juice. Um, this, uh, uh, so like nobody uses the stems when we make, uh, when they make grappa, you do not distill stems. You distem 
the the grape uh, and like if you distill also the juice uh, that is grape distillating it's not grappa when you distill grappa you only distill the solid part of the grape so it means that is uh, the skin the residual pulp and a little bit of the seeds uh, the main thing uh, that the Nonino did for Grappa was the fact that uh, um, like I don't know I, I don't want to I, I don't want to steal too much of your time but like uh, the main thing was that in the past uh, Grappa was considered just made with the leftover um, it was it was it was called the fire water that was able to burn away even hunger so it was just like was just a really really poor product but uh, uh, Nonino, my grandfather especially, understood that if you treat uh, the pomace rightly, you were able to make something that was a way of capturing the essence, uh, uh, the soul of the vineyard and put it in the glass. So in, consider that in Italy, the average distillery has uh, six uh, pot still. My grandfather at the time, that was more than uh, 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago, he distilled, um, he not he distilled, sorry, he built a distillery with 24 pot still, oh. artisanal pot still. Why that? Because he wanted to be able to distill the pomace as soon as it was pressed. So instead of stocking the pomace, because in Italy, uh, you're able to stock the pomace between the end of August till the end of the next year, of the June of the next year, he, he was completely against that and he was distilling day and night during the harvest to be able to distill fresh. And uh, he always had a type of uh, almost fraternal connection with um, the, um, the vineyard that were giving him the, the pomace because he, he wanted to be able to collect the pomace as soon as they were pressed. And if a, wine, a, uh, a winery makes good wine, uh, you can see that from the pomace uh, because if the pomace are too dry, too much press, uh, the winery will have horrible wine and you will never be able to make good crap out of that. But uh, if the pomace has been gently pressed, uh, the, the grape has been gently pressed, uh, the wine will be much sweeter, much aromatic, and you're going to be able to make amazing grappa. And consider that from that day, now we have a distillery that has 66 artisanal pot still. They work only for eight weeks per year, only during the harvest, 24 hours per day, 27 uh, days of the week. In fact, this year, because I was supposed to, to come to the United States for six weeks, I didn't come. In fact, my English got so much worse. But we did uh, a night distillation event. And if you're interested into that, we can organize it. And this next August or next September, we can do No, we lost you, Francesca. <laughs> Thank you, Antoinette. Uh, so um, I, I, did, I didn't know a lot of that. That's brilliant. Um, and, you know, I, I like the idea that, you know, um, if you want to make good grappa, you have to make good wine first. Um, yes. Now, what are your what are your other favorite uh, Italian Amari? <laughs> no, like, uh, ooh, let me think. Um, who, 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 who? Hmm. I don't know, honestly. I, <laughs> All right, so a, we're gonna we're gonna take you. We'll take you through a world tour. And I know. Yes, I love Chiocciaro. Oh yes. Okay. So we have Chiocciaro. So Chiocciaro. So we have Lucano is Chiachar. So um, Lucano um, is from Basilicata. Um, so I'm going to pull up the map of uh, of Italy, and, and we'll we'll talk through some of these. Um, and again, what I uh, again my my favorite one of my favorite things about Amari is that um, you know it's like a drinkable map of Italy. And uh, Italy is a hugely diverse country. Italy didn't exist as a um, a unified country until. Um, the late 19th century. And, you know, uh, the Veneto is, is very different than Sicily and Basilicata is very different than Lazio. Um, so uh, Lucano um, actually comes from uh, an old Latin term uh, for uh, Basilicata. Um, and uh, it has um, all sorts of ingredients in the mix. It's different than 
um, than Onino in the sense that it's, it's made with um, neutral grain spirit as opposed to, um, you know, a, a grape uh, or, or, or grappa, uh, you know, distillate. Uh, but um, it has angelica root, um, uh, it has gentian, and it has many different types of wormwood in the mix. And uh, it is more, you know, profoundly bitter uh, than, uh, than Onino. Uh, certainly, um, and, and distinctly woodsier. Uh, the Chiochiara is really cool. So it's from uh, just outside of Rome, um, from Lazio. And um, the Chiochiara is is very like citrus forward in a, in a really lovely way. Um, so has all sorts of, you know, uh, bitter and sweet orange, um, you know, kind of like these notes of dark chocolate. Um, uh, uh, gentian is a known ingredient. Um, and again, you know, these recipes um, are, you know, very much like uh, Francesca's in the sense that um, you know, grandma will disown you. Uh, grandma will probably off you before uh, you get a chance to reveal uh, the recipe to for anyone. We love um, Amaro Chiochiara because we use it at Revelers Hour to spike uh, beer. Um, so you add a little bit of, uh, we add an ounce of Chiochiara to Miller High Life and it's absolutely delicious. Um, but it is equally delicious on its own and is actually a good substitute for Americone. Um, which is a famous uh, French uh, uh, kind of uh, orange uh, liqueur. Um, but uh, it, it is um, really balanced, um, uh, you know, kind of like Nanino. Um, you know, I think the flavors are a little more caramel inflected uh, than Nanino, but uh, beautiful uh, nonetheless. And then uh, we have Del Capo. Um, we have the Peasantite crew in the mix. So we do have some, uh, Francesco, we have some uh, uh, Italians joining us and we have, uh, you know, uh, second generation Calabrians and Del Capo is a hugely important Calabrian product. What I love about Del Capo, they uh, you know, demand that it be served chilled. I made the mistake of serving Del Capo to a Calabrian woman at room temperature once. And, um, you know, I was lucky to escape with my life uh, from the restaurant. Uh, we had to chill it for her on the spot. Uh, we did the best that we could. But um, it's very hot in uh, Calabria, so it's fitting that their local uh, Amaro uh, is served very chilled. Tangerines um, are a, a known um, ingredient, as are all sorts of other uh, sweet orange, bitter orange, uh, juniper licorice, chamomile. Um, it's a very delicate um, Amaro, and, and I, I like it at room temperature. Um, I think it's delicious at room temperature. I think it passes Francesca's, you know, has to be enjoyed at room temperature test, but um, it's it's very refreshing uh, when it's served uh, chilled. And um, you know, citrus is really an interesting ingredient in in Amari. And um, you know, they can't grow citrus in um, you know in Friuli. You know, there aren't you know um, you know lemon lemon and you know orange groves in northern uh, Italy. It's too cold. But uh, there are you know certainly in in uh, Calabria um, and. Uh, the Vecchio Amar, the Capo, the Capo family started off actually distilling on Mount Etna, and then, um, are you going? Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, oh, no, wait, but no, I gotta go do something. No, we, so we usually, Francesco, we I usually, I have um, a chicken. No, 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 so we, we traditionally, um, we traditionally close out our lessons with a, a, a toast. Uh, do you have a toast that you usually deliver with uh, Nonino? It could be okay, an Italian. I uh, we are the typical really loud Italian family. So like normally we do something like uh, everybody in the way. <laughs> okay, one more one more time, one more time. Okay, I one, Everybody in the way. Yeah, that's beautiful. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Francesca. It's such a pleasure to try your you try your morrow. Yeah. So we promise we'll we'll visit all of us that all of us that can. Bye bye. Ciao. Um, so uh, the the vecchio um, uh, you know, I think you know that that juniper, that licorice in particular, um, you know, emerge often. That licorice um, comes from uh, star anise, um, which is a really fascinating, uh, you know, spice um, and uh, is the the source of a lot of licorice flavors in uh, many of the digestifs, um, you know, that have that you know more kind of uh, profound licorice bite. Um, I, I love this one. I think it's it's really lovely, um, you know, chilled. I, I lament that it's not more widely known um, than uh, than it is. Um, and then uh, that brings us to uh, Montenegro. Um, Montenegro is, uh, it's from the north, um, from Emilia Romagna. Um, it is the most uh, widely consumed uh, Amaro in Italy. 
Um, and uh, it should be said that uh, Montenegro is named after the second wife of Vittoria Emanuel, um, who was the first uh, king of unified Italy. Uh, I don't know what his first wife got. I feel like the first the first wife always gets um, you know uh, you know run over. Um, there's a movie about it. Um, but uh, uh, the second wife gets an amaro. Um, uh, it is a delicious amaro. Um, sadly, just got bought out by Monarch, um, which is an evil. Uh, international beverage brand and they changed the fucking recipe uh, for Montenegro. And um, we we did a side by side of the old and the new, and it's just not as good as it used to be. It's still delicious. Uh, known ingredients include orange peel, vanilla, and eucalyptus. Um, uh, it was hailed uh, by none other than um, a very famous uh, contemporary Italian poet, Gabriele Nuncio, called it the liquor of virtues. Um, uh, but it is less virtuous than it used to be, it should be said. Uh, but Montenegro is great. It's not unlike Nanino in the sense that it is a very useful um, kind of introduction to Amaro. Um, it makes a great mixer. It plays well with friends. And um, a lot of these more bitter uh, Amari that we're going to get into, uh, they tend to be uh, more aggressive, louder voices at the party. And they don't, you know, play quite as well uh, with friends in cocktails. Or if they do, uh, they only really do so a quarter ounce at a time. So, you know, I always enjoy these drinks. I think they're, you know, sufficiently multifaceted to, um, you know, thrive on their own. But, you know, uh, I equally, um, you know, feel like, um, you know, people enjoy playing with them uh, in cocktails. Uh, you know, it is, it, it is, should be said, though, it's easier to play with Nanino and Montenegro than it is with um, uh, Elisir and Sfumato, which we'll, we'll get into in a second. And, um, uh, Montenegro uh, equally has these lovely, goofy um, ads uh, featuring these James Bond-like Italian figures, um, you know, uh, completing um, all sorts of secret agent man missions and then uh, throwing back uh, Montenegro at the end of it. Uh, we should all be so lucky. Um, Ramazzotti, um, up next is uh, the oldest um, branded Italian tomorrow. So Ramazzotti was the first to take you know, this local tradition, and, and Francesca spoke to it, you know, her family always had, um, you know, a, their own recipe. Um, and, you know, historically, a lot of these recipes were codified um, by clerics, um, you know, but uh, entering the modern era, um, you know, some of those recipes were sold, and then, you know, some of those recipes just, um, you know, were, um, you know, gradually subsumed or, you know, uh, were co-opted um, by restaurateurs. Uh, Ramazzotti developed um, at a restaurant near the uh, Opera House in Milan um, as a companion to coffee. And then um, occasionally this restaurant was infamous for replacing its coffee uh, with uh, its uh, Amaro, which is fascinating to me because I would think that the um, coffee would be less expensive than the Amaro. But maybe in that era, uh, the Amaro um, uh, was less expensive. Who knows? Um, uh, Ramazzotti is easy. Um, you know, it's got this like Coca-Cola like uh, vibe. Um, so uh, uh, what do you love about, you know, Montenegro Ramazzotti, um, uh, you know, as, as products and as a former bartender? Um, yeah, I mean, I love the Ramazzotti because of that, like what you were saying, Coca-Cola, root beer, um, kick to it. Um, I think that there's, you know, it's very accessible. You still get that bitterness there, some like espresso bean and, you know, a little bit more of those like spicier baking spices, but it's still in the baking spice realm. Um, Montenegro has just always been uh, very accessible. I think like baby's first tomorrow. Um, love pouring it over gelato as well. Um, I feel like you can play a lot with Montenegro, particularly because it has that like Christmas cake situation. Um, do you want to go into Braulio and Fernet? Or... Uh, we're not going to uh, save my favorite for, uh, and I need to pour myself out a little bit of the Braulio before we move on, Zoe. But um, for the sure. sake of the Ramazzotti, um, uh, I wanted to uh, enumerate some of the known ingredients. And I, I feel bad for uh, enumerating some of uh, Francesca's known ingredients because um, uh, I was quoting from a book about Amari, and uh, the ingredients are quoting from are actually known to be in uh, her secret recipe. So I feel like I, I compromise state secrets. But at any rate, um, uh, known ingredients for Amazoti include bitter orange, cardamom, clove, uh, galangal, which is you know kind of like a, a, a Southeast Asian spice, not unlike ginger, myrrh, um, uh, which feels hugely. Um, uh, seasonal, um, very on brand for the holiday season with myrrh. Uh, myrrh is a resin, it's hugely fascinating. 
Um, it derives from the spiny tree in the Horn of Africa um, and the Arabian Peninsula. This is um, a harvesting of myrrh, um, and it's a sap that flows from this kind of shrub-like tree and hardens, and people then collect. And then, if you're a wise man, um, you know, you, uh, you know, take your ass to Bethlehem and, you know, you honor the newborn savior with your gifts of myrrh. Uh, but um, if you're an Italian, uh, you infuse it uh, into, in this case, uh, Ramazzotti, um, starring a sweet orange, um, equally um, known ingredients. Um, Ramazzotti is, is, is another one of those, I think it's just a great all-purpose um, Amaro to have at a bar, and, and it is one that uh, definitely plays well uh, with, with friends. Um, all right, many of you don't know this product. Um, uh, if you did, it would sell better than it does. It's Braulio. It is the greatest uh, Amaro, in my opinion, um, uh, in existence. Um, and uh, it gets at this, you know, regional difference, um, you know, sets of differences that um, you have, you know, in Italy. So uh, this comes from Valtellina. Uh, you might notice um, uh, this little, uh, you know, coat of arms. That is uh, the coat of arms of the House of Savoy, um, which was uh, this, um, you know, kind of royal family, uh, this empire that um, uh, kind of, uh, it spilled over uh, the border between France, uh, Switzerland, and, uh, and Italy. Um, obviously, uh, they no longer hold sway in this corner of the world, but um, formerly uh, Lombardy was associated with House of Savoy, so that's why that's on there. Um, you're in the mountains. Um, known ingredients for the sake of Braulio include gentian, juniper, wormwood, yarrow, um, uh, and it is aged for two years in Slavonian oak. And this is where that like tincture exercise that we did earlier, I think is really fascinating because if you have those available um, and you have Braulio, taste of Braulio and then revisit the gentian tincture, the wormwood tincture. And I think you'll you know, be able to tease those out as individual ingredients um, in the Braulio. And then that whole thing of barrel aging is magical. Um, I think it's magical for the sake of the Nonino and it's, it's in my mind, like even more magical for the sake of the Braulio. Um, uh, you're dealing with uh, Slavonian oak, um, uh, which comes from Croatia, um, and a two year aging process. Uh, Braulio actually was sold to the Campari group and they did kind of like um, uh, Montenegro. They, they, they claim they didn't change the recipe. So does Montenegro. Everybody knows it's total bullshit. Um, but it, it emerged mostly intact. Um, and it is still. Um, just a, a gorgeous um, product. Uh, Zoe, what do you love about Braille? Um, I like that it has that menthol kick and all of that bitterness that Fernet does, but it doesn't have the aggression of Fernet, nor does it have that ashtray, tar, eucalyptus threw up in a, in a vat. Yeah, um, I, call it, to it. I call it candy canes and like last night's bad choices, you know, for the sake of Fernet. Uh, Fernet Branca is certainly the most famous, um, I think, uh, Amaro um, of its ilk. Um, it should be said that Fernet is a category. So Fernet is a subcategory of Amari. Um, uh, Fernet Branca is not the only Fernet. It is just the most famous one. Fernet's uh, kind of an a, uh, ambiguous category as such, but um, Northern Italian uh, Amari, um, and they come together around this minty uh, flavor profile. Uh, all of them. Um, known ingredients for Fernet Branca, aloe ferox, which we haven't discussed, but another alpine herb, uh, bitter orange cardamom, chamomile, uh, chinchona, myrrh alert, uh, laraha, which is a type of bitter citrus native to curacao, rhubarb root, which we haven't, you know, really discussed at all, but will be important for the sake of one of our later ones, uh, zodoria, which actually comes from Oceania. Um, there's saffron in here. Um, I love the tasting notes from the Amaro book. Uh, strong and medicinal top notes of eucalyptus, elements of candy cane, mint toothpaste, and mentholated cough drop. Um, and, and I do like to say that, you know, um, you know, these northern Italian, you know, products they have, you know, that, that minty, that, you know, alpine woodsiness, I think, you know, Braulio's is just elevated. Um, you know, I like to say that idiot bartenders drink Burnett Branca, um, you know, erudite psalms uh, drink Braulio, which makes me sound, you know, as Francesca would say, like a total asshole. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, leaning into that uh, for the sake of, of Braulio. Um, and, you know, this particular flight, you know, from, you know, I think the Montenegro through the Fernet gives you a sense of the spectrum of bitterness uh, on these drinks. And they really do range um, from, you know, not bitter in the least for the sake of, of Montenegro to uh, much more profoundly so 
uh, for the sake of Burnett Bronca. Uh, Zoe, do you have any more questions uh, from the commentary before I move on to the dear God, why uh, bitter, uh, you know, kind of section of our Amara class? Yeah, a few um, really great questions. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the botanicals are different for Amari as uh, um, in terms of gin botanicals? Oh, that's great. Um, uh, there's a lot of overlap there. Right? And um, there's juniper. I um, uh, was used, um, for instance, in, uh, I did all sorts of uh, research on uh, uh, botanicals in the mix here, but uh, the Braulio itself actually has juniper in it. Um, and I, I think, you know, I, I love juniper. Um, uh, but, um, you know, they all come out of the same set of traditions. So this you know, uh, whether it's uh, aperitifs like Campari and Aperol, whether it's Jagermeister, um, whether it's Malort, uh, you know, God help you, um, you know, Spock, um, you know, gin, etc., cetera, Akavit, you know, this, you know, notion of infusing uh, alcohol, you know, they're all part of the same family. They just get branded differently depending on where you are. Um, and, you know, gin came out of a uniquely English um, tradition. Uh, gin's a bit different because it's typically redistilled. Um, after it's infused, and uh, most Amari are not, although some are. Um, uh, and again, you know, this Amari, you know, kind of um, uh, category is very nebulous. Um, and, you know, typically I think the most useful distinction is just in practice. Um, so uh, Amari typically in the Italian parlance would just be consumed at the end of a meal. Um, whereas, you know, bitters like Campari or Aperol consumed at the beginning. Um, so that's, you know, I find that, you know, the most, um, you know, useful uh, distinction uh, for the sake of, of these drinks. Uh, what else you got, Sam? Um, how is sugar added? There's so much bitterness and it's kind of like balanced with a little bit of RS. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I, it's fascinating, like uh, in researching this historically, I read that um, uh, sugar, um, you know, these, these products became sweeter when they hit the market as popular um, kind of drinks to consume at the end of the meal. Um, I, I would imagine that the sugar would be added at the end, um, of the production process. Obviously, Francesca is not going to cop to that. Um, you know, uh, I don't know why you would add it early. I don't, I think, you know, you ultimately, you would be diluting your spirit. Um, and, you know, the lower proof the spirit, the less you're extracting. Although different flavors are more alcohol soluble and more water soluble. So, um, you know, there are some people that will do two um, uh, tinctures. They'll do a set of tinctures at a very high um, uh, ABV, um, you know, with something that's close to 100% alcohol, and then they'll do something at a much lower uh, ABV um, to, you know, kind of uh, suss out, you know, these different dimensions uh, of flavor. So, um, again, gin typically redistilled higher proof than most Amari, but, you know, emerges out of the same uh, tradition um, as, as these drinks. Yeah, that's interesting, too, because in fermentation, if you add sugar, then you can increase the potential alcohol at the end for the final product. But with distilling, it's quite the opposite. Um, could you go over um, some of your uh, the specific pairings um, that are in the snack pack to each Amari? Yeah, so if, I mean, for the sake of the snack pack, honestly, it's just a lot of cheese. Um, I uh, had fun uh, playing around with this uh, earlier and, um, you know, uh, tasting through um, you know, the various cheeses with the uh, different uh, Amari. Um, I always find that I like the harder, saltier with the more citrusy, lighter. Um, you know, much like I generally enjoy harder, saltier cheeses with kind of lighter wines. Um, and, and the softer cheese, the hummingbird, um, I enjoyed with uh, the darker, more bitter Amari. Um, uh, my reflection, though, was that, you know, uh, you have uh, in Amaro a very loud voice. Um, you know, for the sake of uh, pairing, and you need a similar loud voice to work with it. Um, and, you know, uh, these pairings function less as yin to the yang sometimes than they do as a palate reset in a cool way. So, you know, something as unctuous as cheese sometimes can linger on the palate, you know, either in a pleasant or unpleasant way. And, and Amaro has this great way of resetting the palate. Um, and, and I really enjoyed that. And, and, and the cheese does the same for the Amaro. You know, um, you know, some of these uh, Amari, you know, Fernet, it, it doth linger. Um, and, you know, if you want to move on and try something else, the cheese has a great way of, you know, shortening that fuse and, and allowing you to move on to something else. And I, I think that's, you know, super cool. And then I can't overstate, um, you know, my love affair with citrus jam. So as much as this is a cheese pairing, you know, John and I kind of 
um, you know, kind of envisioned it as a citrus jam pairing. And uh, all of these, um, you know, Francesca spoke to the uh, all sorts of citrus that went into hers. All of these uh, Amari contain citrus and it is the glue that kind of holds them together. And, um, you know, to try them with citrus in context, I think is, is really uh, super fun. Um, so I'm uh, going to move on, cover the last four in toast, but um, and then, you know, cover all sorts of more questions. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to sit here and sip on Amaro uh, as long as you like. Um, Chinar um, is uh, artichoke based. And uh, what's kind of cool is you end up with these like odd botanical ingredients that you wouldn't commonly think of um, in the context of alcohol. So artichokes, you know, I, I don't know about you, but like I, they're, they're pleasantly bitter and vegetable, but I wouldn't think about infusing artichoke into my favorite dram. But uh, the Italians went about it. Um, you know, because artichokes are just thistles. They're giant thistles. Um, you know, if you give them long enough, uh, they will flower, and it looks really awesome and weird. Um, but uh, Chinar is the most famous uh, artichoke-derived um, uh, Amaro. Certainly not the only only one. The uh, brand name comes from uh, the scientific name for uh, the artichoke, Chinar uh, scolimus. Um, uh, it, it's a great mixer, Chinar. It's actually very low um, ABV um, uh, Amaro. Um, and uh, it goes into um, one of my favorite cocktails, which is the Sinners and Saints. Um, and it occurs to me that I'm going to owe you guys some cocktail recipes, um, uh, and uh, I will uh, send those around in the recap. Um, the paper plane uh, is, is definitely worth mentioning, but the Sinners and Saints is a, essentially kind of like a Negroni Spalato variation. If you want to sound like a real doucher um, in cocktail culture, refer to a cocktail as a variation on a known cocktail. That's what people do. Um, so um, uh, the Sinners and Saints is an amazing cocktail developed by a New York uh, OG bartender. Um, it's uh, Chinar um, uh, and uh, Campari sparkling wine, and it is stupidly good. Um, uh, but Chinar works beautifully as a mixer because um, in spite of being you know bitter, it's a bitter at a lower ABV. Um, so it clocks at like, it's almost vermouth level. It's like 16 and a half, um, which is very low uh, by Amara standards. Um, I have a new love affair uh, with this product. Um, uh, Capaletti is the only distillery that's represented twice uh, in our flights. And there's a reason for that because everything they do is fucking awesome. Um, they're in um, uh, Trentino, Alto, Alto Adige. Um, uh, Chinar comes from Lombardy. Um, uh, Alto Adige is kind of a German speaking uh, corner of uh, Northern Italy. Um, and uh, this is a rhubarbo. Um, the rhubarb here is not the rhubarb um, that we throw in our pies. It's Chinese rhubarb, um, uh, which, which looks um, a, a little different. And uh, typically you're using the, the root um, here um, as opposed to the flowers. Uh, it's actually a beautiful plant, it should be said. Um, are you, are the rhubarb we, we commonly use is actually a hybrid of Chinese rhubarb. And, some other plant that uh, I'm not remembering. Um, uh, Spumato um, is lovably smoky, um, and uh, 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 spuma means smoke um, in Italian. Um, it is, it's stunning. Um, it's a very much an artisanal product. Um, uh, it is equally good in cocktails. Um, it works really beautifully um, in um, a Negroni uh, as a replacement for vermouth because it is like Chinar in that it's at 20% ABV. Um, so um, if you learn nothing else, you should learn that, you know, these uh, mixers that are at kind of lower ABV, um, they play better with friends sometimes than the ones that are at higher uh, ABV. Uh, but the Sumato is just bonkers delicious um, on its own, uh, I find, um, as well. Um, and uh, so, again, uh, you're dealing with uh, Trentino uh, Alto Adige, um, uh, which is just outside, of this one, the distillery here is just outside of Trento, so we're not in... German speaking Northern Italy, but uh, we are uh, further north, closer to the Alps even uh, than Friuli. Um, and then uh, the last two, um, uh, two personal favorites. This is the Dear God Why Bitter Beer Face portion of the program. Amaro Sibila um, and Elisir Novasalis, the original monster uh, Dear God Why Amaro. Uh, I'm gonna pull up the map here again. Um, so Sibila is from the Adriatic coast. Um, from La Marque. Um, it's the same distillery that makes Alborista. Um, it is made with smoked botanicals. Um, so bitter orange, chinchona, cinnamon clove, gentian, uh, both flowers and roots, which is super cool. Uh, rhubarb root um, and sweet orange. And then they add honey um, as a sweetener, which is unique for the sake of Sibilla. Um, I love that Sibilla is just hugely in your face, like 
fuck you, I'm bitter, but strangely elegant and comes around and is multifaceted. So for me, it's a rare morrow that like leads with bitterness and then becomes something else as opposed to leading with something else and then devolving into bitterness. Um, and then there is El Sir Novosalis, uh, which is amazing um, uh, and uh, uh, comes from uh, the same distillery uh, that makes the sfumato. Um, the uh, ingredients here include aloe, burdock, uh, root, uh, chinchona, uh, dandelion greens, um, which are hugely bitter, gentian, which is hugely bitter. Um, it's based on Marsala wine, Marsala being from Sicily. And then the secret ingredient here is another tree sap, not myrrh, but a mystery Sicilian tree sap um, that gives you this um, really um, unique um, and unapologetic bitterness that is almost unlike anything in uh, the Amara world. Um, it's like sappy and, and downright confrontational in a really cool way. Um, I encourage those of you who are still drinking this at home to chime in, please, uh, with your personal uh, Elisir Novoselis stories, especially if you've never had it uh, before. Uh, Zoe, do you have anyone uh, that is uh, chiming in uh, on uh, the, the more bitter, uh, you know, uh, unapologetic, uh, bad as I want to be, uh, flight for the time being. And do you want to add your own thoughts uh, for the sake of uh, these offerings? Uh, there's just one, the Elisir dot, 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 dear God, the Elisir <laughs> possible to drink. Yes, yes. Um, totally agree. They're, they're harder. Um, I think it's one of those things where playing around with them with either um, different cocktails or um, different foods is just necessary. It should be said, uh, Elisir and Sibila are terrible mixers. Um, you know, they just, you know, you could add, you know, a few drops and the cocktail would just taste like Elisir and Sibila. You know, cocktail should be greater than the sum of its parts. You know, when you add one of these to a cocktail, you know, they become the only uh, parts. So um, they're kind of like, they don't play well with friends, but um, I find them hugely compelling uh, uh, nonetheless. Um, and, th and there is like the LC in particular, it's like sappy. I mean, you can, you can smell the tree. Um, uh, it is, yeah, it is green. It is like, yeah, it is just offensive. Um, but it's one of those, for me, it's kind of like looking at the sun. It's like, uh, you know, initially I wonder what I've gotten myself into. And then I, I strangely like it. Um, it's, it's a sadistic drinking pleasure. Um, whew, sorry, I'm still recovering a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it should be known that, like, it should be said that the Elisir Novalis, like, lives in a freezer. I don't. Yeah, yeah. You can, you, can sort of, you, can you can sort of chill. I don't know if they, uh, I don't know if that's, like, a serving suggestion as such, but, like, it, do, it does do well in, in a freezer. Um, yeah. Then could you speak a little bit more about how the um, alcohol um, differs in so many different Amari? You know, we have like Chinar, we have Chinar 70, we have some that are clocking in at like, like this um, Rabararo is like vermouth-like, but we have some that are above 40%. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, wherever, again, it speaks to this, um, you know, diversity um, within the category. Um, it also speaks to, you know, the fact that you have local traditions and people developing, you know, these more kind of homespun recipes and um, they just land wherever it feels right to them. You know, it's a hugely unregulated category. Um, and, you know, so, you know, some people find, you know, 20% alcohol more pleasant. Other people, you know, enjoy uh, something closer to 30%. And, you know, there's nothing uh, wrong with that. You know, it will say, you know, the higher... The alcohol, you know, typically, um, you know, the um, more, uh, you know, profoundly expressive, you know, the um, accompanying flavors will be. So bitter will be more bitter. Sweet will be more sweet um, as, as the alcohol gets higher. Um, bitter in particular, um, you know, tends to be more pronounced um, as the, the alcohol rises um, on, on all of these. But yeah, typically you're not at 40. Um, I can't think of any of these that land quite at 40. Typically, you're somewhere in the um, you know 20 to to 30 percent uh, range with these, and and you know just for the sake of comparison, uh, most vermouths land somewhere between like 18 and 22 percent alcohol. Heard of that? Um, could you speak a little bit more about how the Amari um, can be indicative of the region, or if 
um, each region like clings on to local ingredients. I think, you know, Nonino is a great example of how um, that's not necessarily the case since, you know, the citrus is coming from Campania and Sicily. Um, but could you speak a little bit more about how like there's a regional identity, I guess? Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was kind of cool to hear Francesca speak to her proximity to Venice. So, um, you know, Venice was the center of the Renaissance era spice trade. Um, and Italy is very much at the crossroads of Europe. Um, and, you know, so you have local ingredients, but then you have, um, you know, a market basket of ingredients that comes from throughout um, the old world and throughout, you know, the new world. And, um, you know, uh, all sorts of things that, you know, came from, you know, these exotic remote outposts that, you know, uh, the Italians, the Spanish, um, the French, you know, gained access to, um, you know, beginning in, you know, the uh, 16th century. Um, you know, so you'll see some local ingredients and you'll see some, you know, borrowed ingredients for all of these, you know, uh, and, and it gets murky. Um, you know, I find you know, the, there is a, a distinguishable style for the sake of the more alpine products, you know, that piney, uh, minty, herbal quality, you know, is uh, for products like Burnett and Peraglio, something that I associate with the North. Um, and then for something like the, you know, the Del Capo, for something like the Lucano that has more of this kind of like citrusy cinnamon inflection for something like Chichiara is from Lazio. You know, it's just Rome, but, you know, um, still, you know, feels fairly Southern. You know, you have these more citrus inflected um, drinks. Um, and then everything else just feels kind of like a mashup. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I, I think there, there is a, a bit of both happening. There's a bit of a borrowing from the local landscape and a bit of, you know, just leveraging, you know, what's available. And, and over time, you know, people create a, a, a flavor profile that is associated with the region you know, that, you know, might result from um, borrowed products or, or might result from native products, but, you know, it's identifiably, um, you know, associated with a particular corner of Italy, uh, nonetheless. And then, you know, think about something like uh, uh, pizza, you know, or pasta. So, you know, um, uh, tomato, you know, a huge part, obviously, of, of that uh, equation. Um, you know, tomatoes are new world, uh, uh, you know, flora. Um, uh, the mozzarella on Nepal Neapolitan pizza come from water buffaloes. What the fuck? Um, you know, water buffaloes are from, you know, that they're Asiatic. You know, how the hell did they get to Naples? Um, you know, so you have always this, you know, uh, but, you know, olive oil couldn't be, you know, more intrinsically Southern Italian, but, you know, the, the Italians adopted their love of it from the Greeks and Naples is this hugely, you know, Greek inflected, you know, uh, Italian place. So, you know, th there's always this borrowing in, in the food world. Um, all food is fusion, um, you know, and, and Amaro uh, embodies that, you know, almost, um, you know, kind of more poetically than any other drink that I can think of. Um, I'm, just, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm gonna close things out very quickly before uh, we, we finish with questions with uh, this notion of, of lingering. Um, obviously this is actually, uh, one of the latest toasts I've gotten to, and thank you uh, everyone uh, for for staying for staying on uh, this long. Uh, but I, I love this idea of enforced lingering, um, you know, and this kind of uh, slowing down of life. Um, and it's something that Amari invites, and something that you know the Italians uh, embraced, and something that we do uh, every week um, through this virtual platform. And um, you know, something that you know is enforced, um, you know, in the midst of pandemic, but something uh, that I hope we will consciously adopt, um, you know, once uh, life speeds up again. Um, and I want to share, uh, we're going to deliver our, our normal toast, but I want to share uh, as well one of my favorite um, uh, Amaro adverts um, of all time. So uh, it should be said that Chinar has one of the greatest uh, advertising slogans uh, of all time. And uh, Chinar um, Ernesto Calindri, Ernesto Calindri, uh, this great uh, Italian leading man of the era, uh, starred in these adverts that made Chinar popular throughout Italy. And the slogan was um, against the vicissitudes of modern life or against the pains of modern life. But it just sounds better in Italian. So uh, we're going to toast as we do uh, alone together, but also um, uh, as uh, Ernesto would uh, alone together, but contra il logorio della vita moderna. Brindis. Salut.
Uh, what else you got, Tim? Um, is there a botanical that's responsible for that Coca-Cola root beer flavor? I, I think it would be rhubarb to some extent. That's a really good question. I think it would be rhubarb. I think it would be cinnamon. Um, uh, there is, uh, so what is the cola botanical? There is, um, uh, what is like Inca Cola um, have it? There is like a, uh, a distinct botanical that, that's responsible for the cola flavor um, that, you know, I'm not readily um, uh, thinking of. Um, I think chinchona um, could, you know, contribute to that. Um, you know, cocoa beans, um, you know, could contribute to that, but I don't think they're, you know, typically um, in the mix when it comes to, um, you know, Amari, um, the caramel uh, that is added. Um, so uh, most Amari are uh, kind of finished um, with, you know, some kind of, you know, caramel uh, flavor. Um, and, you know, that certainly uh, could, um, you know, contribute uh, to the flavor. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that there's, um, th there is a distinct Coca-Cola botanical. I mean, uh, it's not cocaine. I think uh, Coca-Cola <laughs> originally had uh, cocaine in it, but it's certainly not cocaine. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what's in the mix, uh, long, long story short, uh, but I should. Um, and, but it, it should be said that, you know, even Coca-Cola itself, um, you know, um, all of, you know, derives from the same, you know, quack medicinal uh, tradition um, as, you know, these other um, ingredients. But, you know, cola nuts um, were, were the name, the namesake of, of Coca-Cola, uh, K-O-L-A. I can't, I, I can't think of an Amaro that has cola nuts in it uh, as such. So I think it's more of like the, the caramel um, that you get from the, um, you know, the, the sugar. Um, than, than anything else. And then all the baking spices that go into the mix. Totally. Um, what is your favorite um, Amaro shot of choice coming from the bartender world? Is it Braulio or do you have a different favorite? Um, I don't like to drink Braulio as a shot, um, actually. Uh, it just feels like too good for that. I want to linger over Braulio. Um, as a shot, um, we were doing... Um, we did this thing that was like, uh, oh, we did uh, the, the shot called Ango Traces that I really liked, actually. So this was this was actually a, uh, most people, you know, claim things as inventions and are not. This was actually a, uh, a tale of goat invention. It's uh, um, uh, equal parts uh, Buffalo Trace bourbon, which is just a great entry-level bourbon, and Angostura Amaro. So that um, the people that make Angostura bitters, um, uh, they uh, kind of made, created this Amaro. Um, that I didn't include in our lesson, even though I love it because um, it's not Italian. Um, but equal parts, um, Buffalo Trace and Angostura Amaro um, creates a drink that we call the Ango Trace. Um, uh, that is uh, Dan DiGenova um, uh, coin, uh, but uh, that is delicious. Um, uh, so there are all sorts of like weird Amaro mashups like that, like, uh, you know, like two part you know, little shots that, that are, that are super fun. Uh, there are a bunch of others that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head, but um, I guess that would be my, my favorite right off the bat. Yeah, I remember something called Chartango, which was like green chartreuse. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, another, yeah I, mean, I, I, I enjoy chartreuse, but I'm not like a chartreuse on tap kind of guy. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, that being said, for those who don't know, it's like the bartender's handshake to take a shot of Fernet with someone. Um, but nonetheless, being a cocktail or wine professionals, then you can't taste anything other than menthol for a very long time. So it's not that great if you're actually I'm true to that. Um, and I, I didn't even get into the physiology of taste for this lesson. You know, one of my favorite things about bitters is that, um, you know, we are genetically hardwired um, to be... Um, this is where everyone tunes out for the sake of this lesson. When I, <laughs> when I start talking about the physiology of taste, um, our numbers plummet. Um, but um, uh, it should be said we are, you know, highly attuned to bitter flavors. So uh, this is kind of cool. This is um, those are our, our micromoles per liter. So it's the uh, SI measurement of concent relative concentration of a drink. And basically, what this is showing is that um, for comparably, it's a it's a threshold. Um, calculator. And this is our uh, human threshold to detect these various flavors. So what it says is that you need a shit ton of units to detect something that's sweet. Um, and, and sucrose and glucose um, 
you know, they're um, uh, variously uh, perceptible as, as, as sweet. Uh, fructose, which mysteriously is not on here, I don't know why, but is actually even, even more uh, perceptibly sweet, not quite as sweet as saccharin. But the idea here is that, you know, it takes a lot of units of sugar for us to register as something as sweet. Um, it takes slightly fewer units uh, to register something as salty, salty, slightly fewer still to register sour, but very few to register bitter. Um, and, you know, the evolutionary program there is that, um, you know, bitter equal poison uh, to us. So if you wanted to survive, it was an evolutionary advantage to be able uh, to astutely taste bitter. Um, you know, so, you know, what's cool about that for the, you know, sake of drinks that are potentially poisonous? Well, you know, you're dealing with something that we are highly tuned to perceive and to taste and, you know, to, um, you know, detect and pick apart. So, um, you know, this bitter dimension of, of flavor is the one that we are, you know, most genetically adept at you know, dissecting. And, and if you really want to dig deep with these things at the end of the meal, you know, that's, that's what I enjoy about them. You know, they're self-contained cocktails and they're hugely dynamic and interesting uh, because we are so sensitive uh, to them. Absolutely. Anything else? If you have other questions, um, I know you have a few plugs and a few things that you want to tell everyone. Oh yeah, for the yes, yeah, for the fifty plus folks on. So, um, uh, so we have a, a cocktail class on Thursday. Um, we are bleeding every last marginal dollar out of the holiday season, and uh, we thank all of you uh, for uh, contributing uh, to that. Uh, we love you, and we're hugely grateful. Uh, for your ongoing support. Um, but cocktail class on Thursday to benefit Miriam's Kitchen, uh, building out three drinks, uh, which are available through the same store you purchased your flights uh, with. Uh, Miriam's does amazing work. Uh, we have worked with them since we opened a Jail of Goat. Um, and uh, it wouldn't feel right um, to let the holiday season pass without raising some money for them. Um, we have uh, Greatest Hits uh, coming up next week, if you haven't had a chance to uh, add your voice uh, and, you know, uh, tell me what wines you want to bring back. Um, there's a survey on previous mailers um, that will circulate again tomorrow um, that you can add your voice to. Uh, lastly, um, if you want to give the gift of wine school, um, uh, I'll be uh, throwing out uh, the last lesson of the year uh, early. Uh, that will be featuring uh, Philippa Pato, um, who is... Uh, I have the Zoe and I's girl crush, um, lovely woman uh, with her uh, Flemish husband, William, um, makes um, amazing wine uh, in the Bahia region of central Portugal. Um, you know, arguably one of the most kind of um, high profile winemakers that we've had um, on our chat and certainly um, one of the most lovely um, and hospitable. Um, and uh, that will be the 27th, that'll be the last lesson of the year uh, before we go on a January uh, holiday. Uh, so, you know, if you're looking uh, for a last minute gift idea and you want to buy a flight of wines for someone uh, to enjoy with that class, we're going to throw that lesson out early for you um, so that um, you can do so. So, um, you know, we're spreading the holiday cheer uh, the best we can. And uh, I thank you all uh, for spreading it along with us and being, um, you know, the best uh, guest, you know participants, students uh, that a virtual wine school could ever ask for. Uh, we love you. Thank you, Zoe. Thank uh, you. Ciao. Cheers. Ciao.